Section 16 of The Black Dog and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Stevenson. The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard. The Devil in the Churchyard. Henry Turley was one of those awkward old chaps as had more money than he knowed what to do with. Shadrach, we called him, the silly man. He had worked for it, worked hard for it, but when he was old he stuck to his fortune and wouldn't spend a sixpence of it on his comforts. What a silly man! The Thatcher, who was thus talking of Henry Turley, long since dead and gone, in the black cat of Starncombe, was himself perhaps fifty years old. Already there was a crank of age or of dampness or of mere custom in most of his limbs, but he was bluff and gruff and hale enough, with a bluffness of manner that could only offend a fool, and fools never listened to him. Shadrach, that's what we called him, was a good man with cattle, a masterpiece. He would strip a cow as clean as a tooth, and you never knowed a cow have a bad quarter as Henry Turley ever milked. And when he was buried, he was buried with all that money in his coffin holding it in his hand, I reckon. He had plenty of relations. You wouldn't know him. It is thirty years ago I be speaking of. But it was all down in black and white, so as no one could touch it. A lot of people in these parts had a right to some of it. Jim Skerritt, for one, and Issy Hawker a bit. Mrs. Keelson, poor woman, ought to have had a bit, and his own brother, Mark Turley. But he left it in the will, as all his fortune was to be buried in the coffin along of him. "'Twas cruel, but so it is, and so it will be, "'for whenever such people has a shilling to give away, "'they goes and claps it on some fat pig's haunches. "'The foolishness. Sixty pounds it was, in a canister, "'and he held it in his hand. "'I don't believe a word of it,' said a mild-faced man, "'sitting in the corner. "'Henry Turley never did a deed like that.' "'What?' growled the Thatcher, with unusual ferocity. "'Course I'm not disputing what you're saying, but he never did such a thing in his life.' "'Then you calls me a liar?' "'Certainly not. Oh, no, don't misunderstand me, but Henry Turley never did any such thing. I can't believe it of him.' "'Huh. I be telling you facts, and facts be true one way or another. Now you wants to call over me, you wants to know the rights of everything and the wrongs of nothing.' "'Well,' said the mild-faced man, pushing his pot toward the teller of tales, I might believe it tomorrow, but it's a bit of a twister now, this minute. Ah, that's all right, then. The Thatcher was completely mollified. Well, the worst part of the case was his brother Mark. Shadrach served him shameful, treated him like a dog. Good health. Ah, like a dog. Mark was older nor him, about seventy, and he lived by himself in a little house out by the hanging post. Not much of a cottage, it warn't, just waddle and daub with a thetch of straw. But the lease was running out. T'was a lifehold affair. And unless he bought this little house for fifty pound, he'd got to go out of it. Well, old Mark hadn't got no fifty pounds. He was ate up with rheumatics and only did just a little light labor in the woods. They might as well a asked him for the king's crown. So he said to his master, would he lend him the fifty pounds? No, I can't do that, his master says. You can reduct it from my wages, Mark says. Nor I can't do that neither, says his master. But there's your brother Henry. He's worth a power of money. Ask him. So Mark asks Shadrach to lend him the fifty pounds, so as he could buy this little house. No, says Henry, I can't. Nor he wouldn't. Well, old Mark says to him, I don't wish you no harm, Henry, he says, but I hope as how you'll die in a ditch. Good health. And sure enough he did. That was his own brother. He were stricken with the sun and died in a ditch, Henry did, and when he was buried his fortune was buried with him, in a little canister, holding it in his hand, I reckons. And a lot of good that was to him. He hadn't been buried a month when two bad parties put their heads together. Levi Carter, one was, he was the sexton, a man that was half a loony, as I always thought. Oh, yes, he had got all his wits about him, somewheres, only they didn't often get much of a quorum. Still he got them, somewheres. T'other was a chap by the name of Impey, 
lived in Slack the Shoemaker's house down by the old traveler's garden. He wasn't much of a mutcher, helped in the field work and did shepherding at odd times, and these two chaps made up their minds to go and collar Henry Turley's fortune out of his coffin one night and share it between themselves. "'Twas crime, you know. Might have been prison for life, but this impy was a bad lot. He'd the manners of a pig. Puh, filthy. And I expects he persuaded old Levi on to do it. Bad as body snatchin', course it was. So they goes together one dark night, long in November it was, and well you knows all of you, as well as I, that nobody can't ever see over our churchyard wall by day, let alone on a dark night. You all knows that, don't you? asserted the Thatcher, who appeared to lay some stress upon this point in his narrative. There were murmurs of acquiescence by all except the mild-faced man, and the Thatcher continued, "'Twere about nine o'clock when they dug out the earth. "'Twarn't a very hard job, for Henry was only just a little way down. "'He was buried on top of his old woman, and she was on top of her two daughters. "'But when they got down to the coffin, Impey didn't much care for that part of the job. "'He felt a bit sick, so he gives the hammer and the screwdriver to Levi, "'and he says, "'Levi,' he says, "'are you game to make a good job of this?' "'Yes, I be,' says old Levi. "'Well, then,' Impey says, "'Yous'll have my smock on now while I just creeps off to old Wanaker's sheep "'and collars one of they fat lambs over by the lotments.' "'You're not going to leave me here,' says Carter. "'What be I going to do?' "'You go on and finish this here job, Levi,' he says. "'You get the money and put back all the earth, "'and don't stir out of the yard afore I comes or I'll have your blood.' "'No,' says Carter. "'You mon do that.' "'I'll do that,' Impey says. "'They've got some smartish lambs, I can tell ye, fat as snails.' "'No,' says Carter. "'I won't have no truck with that, taint right.' "'You will,' says Impey. "'And I'll get the sheep. "'Here's my smock. "'I'll meet ye here again in ten minutes. "'I'll have that lamb if I ask to cut his blasted head off.' "'And he rushed away before Levi could stop him. "'So Carter puts on the smock and finishes the job.' He got the money and put the earth back on poor Henry and tidied it up, and then he went and sat in the church porch, waiting for this impy to come back. Just as he did that, an oldish man passed by the gate. He was coming to this very place for a drop of drink, and he sees old Levi's white figure sitting in the church porch, and it frittened him so that he took to his heels and tore along to this very room we be sitting in now, only twas thirty years ago. "'What in the name of God's the matter with you?' they says to him, for he'd a face like chalk, and his lips was blue as a whetstone. "'Have you seen a goost?' "'Yes,' he says. "'I have seen a goost. Just now, then.' "'A goost,' they says. "'A goost. You haven't seen no goost.' "'I seen a goost. Where are you seen a goost?' So he tell them he seen a goost sitting up in the church porch. I shan't have that, says old Mark Turley, for he was a sitting here. I tell you twas then, says the man. Can't be nothing worse than I be myself, Mark says. I say as tis, the man said, and he was vexed too. Go and see for yourself. I would go too and all, said old Mark, if only I could walk it. But my rheumatics be that screamacious I can't walk it. Goosts. There's ne'er a mortal man as ever seed a goost. I'd go, my lad, if my legs would stand it. And there was a lot of talk like that until a young sailor spoke up. Irish he was. His name was Pat Crow. He was on furlough. I don't know what he was a-doing in this part of the world, but there he was, and he says to Mark, If you be game enough, I be and I'll carry you up to the churchyard on my back. A great stropping feller he was. You will? says Mark. That I will, he says. Well, I be game for ee, says Mark, and so they ups him on to the sailor's shoulders like a sack of corn, and away they goes. But not another one there was man enough to go with them. They went slogging up to the churchyard gate all right, but when they got to staggering along tween the gravestones, Mark thought he could see a something white sitting in the porch. But the sailor couldn't see anything at all with that lump on his shoulders. "'What's that there?' Mark whispers in Pat's ear. And Pat Crow whispers back, just for joking, "'Old Nick in his nightshirt.' 
Steady now, Mark whispers. Go steady, Pat. It's getting up and coming. Pat only gives a bit of a chuckle and says, Ah, that's him. That's just like him. Then Levi calls out from the porch, soft like, You got him, then. Is he a fat un? Holy God, cried the sailor. It is the devil. And he chucks poor Mark over his back at Levi's feet and runs for his mortal life. He was the most frittened of the lot, cause he hadn't believed in anything at all. But there it was. And just as he gets to the gate, he sees someone else coming along in the dark, carrying a something on its shoulder. It was Impy with the sheep. Powers above, cried Pat Crow. It's the day of judgment come for sartin. And he went roaring the news up the street like a madman. And Impy went off somewheres too, but I don't know where Impy went. Well, poor old Mark laid on the ground. He were a game old cock, but he could hardly speak. He was struck dazzled. And Levi was frittened out of his life in the darkness and couldn't make anything out of nothing. He just creeps along to Mark and whispers, Who be that? Who be that? And old Mark looks up very timid, for he thought his last hour was on him, and he says, Be that you, Satan? Drackley Levi heard that all in an unexpected voice. He jumped quicker and my neighbors flee. He gave a yell bigger nor Pat Crow, and he bolted too. But as he went, he dropped the little tin canister, and old Mark picked it up. And he shook the canister, and he heard money in it, and then something began to dawn on him, for he knowed how his brother's fortune had been buried. I read it, I read it, he says. That was Levi Carter, the dirty thief. I read it, I read it, he says. And he put the tin can in his pocket and hopped off home as if he never knowed what rheumatox was at all. And when he opened the canister, there was the sixty golden sovereigns in that canister. Sixty golden sovereigns. Bad things'll be worse afore they're better, says Mark. But they never won't be any better than this. And so he stuck to the money in the canister, and that's how he bought his cottage arter all. Twarn't much of a house, just wattle and daub, with a thetch of straw. But twas what he fancied, and there he ended his days like an old Christian man. Good health. End of section 16. Recording by Aaron Stevenson.